Okay, uh, welcome everyone. Welcome to the Rust Cryptography Interest Group Sync Up Calls. Uh, this is our fifth sync up call. Things have been going great. We've been building lots of momentum. We've been keeping consistent, which is really good. Um, I'm your host, Ernest, and I'm just going to give a very quick opening address uh, for those of you who may be here for the first time so that you can get an understanding and some context around the Rust Cryptography Interest Group. So this call, uh, this sync up call serves as a forum and a round table for Rust developers interested in the cryptography in the cryptography ecosystem, in the Rust cryptography ecosystem and furthering the Rust cryptography ecosystem. Uh, it's about fostering dialogue. Um, this isn't a showcase for your individual project. Um, the core ethos of this is that we all leave our agendas at the door and we all come together to do some blue sky thinking to also diagnose what's needed um, in the rust cryptography ecosystem um, and to work together to move things forward um, this sync up call is initiated and facilitated by concordium uh, through the devx it through the devx initiative which i represent um, if you want to find out more about the devx initiative please follow the devx initiative on twitter um, check out Concordium and follow Concordium um, on their Twitter and of course follow the Rust Lang project as well. The Rust Cryptography Interest Group is also in partnership with the enigmatic and charismatic Tony Arcieri uh, from Rust Crypto Org, um, Rich Saltz uh, from Akamai and the uh, Concordium Blockchain Research Institute, um, which is represented by Diego Arania, Professor Diego Arania, who can't be here today, and Professor Bass Spitters, who is. So I'll just allow um, Tony, Bass, and Diego to say a quick hello. Uh, say hello, Tony, introduce yourself, and Rich, and then Bass. Yeah, hi, I'm uh, Tony Arciri. Uh, yeah, I represent the Euros Crypto Project. Um, and yeah, I work on like pretty boring <laughs> cryptography so kind of like the standard sort of primitives that uh are commonly used <laughs> cool thank you uh rich do you want to say a quick hello uh just add a bit about yourself sure hi uh yeah as i put in the chat i'm more of a recovering open ssl person i helped run that project for a decade um and memory safety and the guarantees that rust provides are real becoming increasingly important to akamai so that's why i'm here right but you know what um congrats are in order from your former colleagues right because of open ssl free so that's yeah. something to big yourself up about man. Um, sure no no yeah I'm, I'm 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 a cynical sarcastic person <laughs> in the industry for you know longer than many have been on earth here but uh yeah open ssl 3.0 came out that was like the final thing that let me leave um we can talk about it later if there's time and interest yes but uh, yeah. yes it is a a very singular achievement great no thank you and bass hi bass if you want to just say something about yourself and cobra very quickly thank you hi my name is uh, bass peters uh we're working on uh we're, we're using rust for at least two two issues here in uh, in my research group that we're doing together with uh, Diego Aranya. So this is a uh, high assurance cryptography, which is functionally correct, fast, side channel resistant, and cryptographically secure, and provably so. And we're looking at uh, more and more protocols, and we have a nice collaboration with the Rust Cryptography Group. We're mostly using Hexpec and, and then several backends, for instance, the Cog Group Assistant. And we're also using uh, Rust smart contracts uh concordium uses rust for smart contracts and we're doing a lot of verification because there are a lot of bugs in smart contracts and we can actually both identify them and uh, suggest and and prove the absence of, of a certain class of uh, of bugs um, amazing thank you amazing thank you very much bass and uh, we're going to hear i think i think high assurance crypto is going to be one of the core topics that we're going to wrestle with we do have a very special guest in the house uh nico Matt Sakis uh, has joined us, um, lead of the Rust language team 
and uh, also on the compiler team. So uh, we'll just allow Nico to say a quick hello uh, before I finish off the rest of my opening address because we're really excited to have um, Nico here to help us tackle one of the key issues that we want to discuss today. Hi, everybody. Yeah, uh, well, I think Ernest covered it. I, I'm the co-lead of the Rust language design team. I've been hacking on the compiler for a long time. Uh, and I'm pretty excited to, to be on this call and hear about what we're going to discuss. So. Amazing. Amazing. Thank you very much, Nico, for being here. So uh, the Rust cryptography interest group falls under the Berlin Code of Conduct the Berlin Code of Conduct, the Rust Code of Conduct. And it's all just very simple, decent human being stuff. Um, on this calls, um, these calls, we want to foster robust debate. We want to foster, um, you know, uh, difference of opinions and everything else. But it just has to be done within the framework of um, considerate and respectful speech and behavior. Um, all very simple, grown up stuff. Uh, so please just be considerate of each other as we do discuss things. So um, we also try to make these calls as frictionless as possible. We all know that Zoom calls can be awkward and unwieldy. And actually, we have Nico to thank for this etiquette as well, because um, this is something that I'm borrowing from um, him and suggested by him is the etiquette for speaking. Um, the reason why I ask for your videos to be switched off is because um, if you want to indicate that you have something to say, um, please, the default will be to switch on your video and your mic, and that will indicate to me that you want to share something. If you keep your video switched on um, to make follow up points, that will indicate that that's how you will indicate that if your laptop doesn't have a webcam. Um, you can use the raise hand function in Zoom. Um, if you don't feel comfortable doing either, um, you can still share your points in the chat. And I will take time to um, scan the chat for salient points and specific points that you may want to share to also help the discourse move forward as well. So the Priority will be given to those who switch on their camera because that will be the first indication that you want to say something. But we will account for all other people who want to make points as well. I hope that makes sense. Right, so for today's agenda, um, you just had my opening address. Um, we're going to give a recap of the last call, which is actually connected to how we're going to open up things. Um, and then we'll have some closing remarks at the end. So um, to move into that um, and to begin with the recap, I wanted to ask um, Rick, um, Tony um, and Rich, because we're focusing on a specific issue. Um, those of you who have been to previous calls know that we have a coordination repository on GitHub where you can open up an issue and that allows us to have focal points for discussion. Um, the, point, the, the point of this is to actually get stuff moving, get stuff done, and actually, you know, impact changes, impact positive changes on the Rust um, cryptography landscape. And the way we have been doing that is by opening up issues on GitHub and then um, having discussions there and then moving forward with them. Last week, we had a very good call where we discussed and we really got into some of the guts of um, the compiler level changes that we would have, we like developers who um, uh, use crypto in Rust would like to see. Um, one of the key things that has, that has come up on multiple calls now is optimization. And I think it's important that we open up with that and give some context around the lay of the land right now, some of the pain points that we've already mentioned, and then we can start that the robust discussion um, through that. So um, if I could start with Tony and ask you, what are some of the, the, the issues that have been raised about optimizations with Rust in, in cryptography, first of all, and then we'll, we'll go through our, our hosts and just some of the things that have already been discussed, even in that issue. So I'll share my screen again and I'll have the GitHub issue actually up so that people can see it. Um, please feel free to join the repository here um you can see this is the actual link here 
Um, you can search for this on GitHub and it should come up. And this is the issue that we're talking about here, compiler level changes. So it's issue number 55. Uh, Tony, would you like to open up with that? Uh, yeah, sure. So <clears throat> you can kind of see in the uh, like uh, presenter view there, um, there was this proposed RFC at one point uh, to add uh, effectively like secret types to the language um, with the idea being that these would kind of map to uh, corresponding secret types in the various code gen backends, uh, specifically LLVM in this case. Uh, and the idea was that the optimizer uh, for these secret types um, would not sort of like insert branches behind your back and that kind of thing, which is very important for a constant time code. Uh, that is how LLVM works today, unfortunately. So you can do everything right, like Rust-C itself can do everything right. Um, you can emit these special constant time instructions. Uh, one's called CMove or conditional move on x86. Uh, it's guaranteed by Intel to run in constant time. But the big problem is uh, if you turn on optimizations in LLVM, has this uh, particular pass that will go through and look at those CMove instructions and replace them with branches for better performance. And this is the exact opposite of what you want in cryptographic code. Um, so unfortunately, uh, the secret types thing in LLVM, it's like a really big monster change. Um, I heard there are various Google projects to implement it, but I haven't heard back from those people in a long time. Um, I'm kind of gathering that maybe some of them got canceled or just didn't ever uh, reach fruition. Um, so I think on this issue in particular, there is a question of, okay, is there something simpler we can do to get uh, guaranteed constant time C-move uh, in some manner? Um, I'm still not sure this is possible because I don't think you can kind of turn off that one annoying thing that rewrites CMove uh, as branches without showing off a whole host of other optimizations that you do actually want. Um, <laughs> so I'm not sure it's actually uh, possible here, although I think it might be interesting to discuss it. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Nico, if you would feel free to come in on this question, then um, we can also allow Rich and Bass to kind of come in with their points as well. Um, is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. Um, I don't have anything to add at this time, though. No, it sounds like <laughs> okay. No, no, no worries at all. Um, well, then, um, Rich and Bass, yeah. if you would like to expound on um, some of the some of the um, uh, issues on this point in particular. That you wanted sure. to add to as well. well yes. Actually, I will add before Rich. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> I, just had one, I, I realized I do actually have a clarifying yeah, question. Yeah, yeah, it happens. Uh, <laughs> you dropped out on the last part of your sentence. I don't have anything to add, but it seems like, and then I lost the adjective. But if you're going to clarify that, go for it. No, no worries. I'll let Nico come back in. And then um, Bass, if you want to uh, jump in as well with some of your experiences as well, that would be great. Before we open it up to the rest of the audience. Um, with people who also have their own experiences, their own specific nuance um, issues that they wanted to bring forward to the table. Um, so, uh, Nico, please go ahead. Okay, thanks. Apologies, Rich, for interrupting. So, so Tony, uh, there's two thoughts that came to mind. Um, one is that we do have experimental support for disabling, or at least there was an RFC, I'm not sure if it was ever implemented, for controlling the level of optimization per function uh, and that would give a tool potentially <laughs> to disable this sort of optimization um, in, a, in a more granular way uh, and might be, I don't think it's what we ultimately want, but it might be a way forward in the shorter term. Have you looked at that at all? And uh, I have yeah, not heard this. about this at all. So that does sound interesting. Um, I mean, it's something where if we can just have a, I mean, if that works, that's great. Otherwise, if there were like some sort of like language level intrinsic for this particular operation that was like 
portable across various platforms, that would be fantastic too. The plot okay. thickens, eh? <laughs> plot thickens. <laughs> there was one other question I wanted to clarify because you said without disabling optimizations that you really do want. And I wasn't clear on whether you meant like throughout your program or specifically yes. within the cryptographic functions that you want those optimizations. We do want those optimizations um, within parts of the uh, cryptographic code. Um, yeah, it's just where you're trying to do this kind of like constant time selection, right? Um, that's where it gets really tricky. So like, for example, the subtle crate today, um, it's kind of like trying to fight the optimizer, right? It has this uh, choice type that kind of creates like a black box to LLVM to try to uh, prevent optimizations. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, I think subtle uh, and specifically it's like conditional select uh, operation would use CMove instead, uh, but there's not a guaranteed way to emit it that LLVM. That will respect. Mode. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Thank you. Great. Great. Uh, Bass, would you like to come in with um, some of your experiences and points around that? Um, and if you want to increase your volume on your mic if possible, that'd be great. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll try to uh, fix the volume uh, issue later. No um, worries. I only have one brief comment that uh, there, there's an extension to the ComCert C compiler, which actually guarantees uh, that that constant time is preserved. So ideally, this is something that I think we would also like to have for Rust. But this is just a, I mean, you, it's, since you invited blue sky thinking, mm. but it's that that will be a long way ahead. But for for parts of C, this exists. Okay, great. No, that's uh, that's that's great to know that there's at least multiple people thinking along the same lines and trying to come up with different solutions in different ways. Um, I want to open this up now to anybody in the audience who has um, some points to make about, first of all, their own experiences with, with optimization issues um, when trying to uh, implement cryptographic code in Rust. And if anyone else is working on anything, even within their own kind of work domain, that could also be brought forward to the table as well. So that's this. This is open to anybody. Um, please just um, switch on your camera and unmute yourself, and then I'll I'll just bring you in, and then you can give a quick TLDR about yourself, and then make your point. So I'll just scan. I'll also be scanning through the chat just to see if anyone is making point. Okay, so hey Nicola, it's great to see you again. Um, Nicola's made a point. Uh, I think constant time conditional select move is one part of the equation. The other is the optimization, not stripping away rights that look to the compiler as of no consequence, but are for not leaving stuff on the heap. But but are for not leaving stuff on heat or to prevent some subtle side channels. Um, great point, great point, Nick. If you wanted to expound on that, please feel free to do so. Um, so I think that gets to you, uh, just this general idea of zeroization. Um, so that one I do think is uh, sort of solvable in uh, Stable Rust today. So I'm the author of the Zero Eyes Crate. Um, and it, it attempts to solve this problem uh, just for like, here is a value in memory, uh, turn it into zeros. Um, so it attempts to solve it by using a combination of volatile writes and a compiler fence. Um, that works specifically for clearing a value um, where things get tricky is uh, move semantics and especially until things like placement uh, by return land. Mm -hmm. um, there are lots of ways to leave copies of values uh, lying around on the stack that's uh, somewhat invisible to the programmer, <laughs> like, unless you're uh, using like Godbolt or something and looking at the assembly. You may not necessarily know you're leaving a copy. Uh, a lot of times uh, those copies will be optimized away. Um, 
like placement by return, I think is one of the remaining sharp edges. Um, so having some better way to zero memory would be nice. Um, I know it's a really tricky problem. Um, so uh, kind of blue sky thinking here, a uh, thing I would really like uh, that like the Linux kernel does, uh, for example, is a way to annotate functions that are working with transient secrets. And instead of uh, zeroizing like every single one of those transient secrets when they're dropped and then potentially missing these moves and that kind of thing, uh, what you can do is when you enter the sort of like critical section of the code where you're dealing with these secrets, um, you can kind of record a, a high watermark on the stack. Like this is where the stack grew to. And then when you're done, after you've like worked with all these secrets and some may still be sitting around on uh, what used to be the stack, right? Uh, you can just zero all the memory between the current stack frame and that high watermark in one pass. So that avoids like, you know, if you're creating all these secrets, all these stack frames, right? You're not like zeroing them and then immediately overwriting them with another stack frame. Like that's kind of useless. Um, so I propose this on Rust of Turtles, haven't really done much more than that, but uh, I think that would be a really nice uh, feature to have uh, specifically for like cryptographic algorithms that take an input, do some work and then spit out an output and you just wanna get rid of all the toxic waste that's left over. Yeah, that's a great point. Um, hi, Watson, great to have you. Um, I saw you switch on your camera and hey, Greg, this guy. Good to see you as always. Uh, I'll let you come in next. So, hi, Watson. Uh, please make your point. Yeah, hi, I'm Watson. I'm from Cloudflare. I work in Cloudflare Research. Uh, Nicola put their finger on some that it's a. It's not just about conditional selects. What you really want from a secret type is you want to have a a time related semantics that the compiler and all the optimization passes preserve. And it, it, you know there are certain optimizations that change the sequence of memory accesses you want. You want to have a loop, let's say you're adding numbers. You want to be able to have the compiler do all the things it needs to do to put the loads and the stores in the right places to align with your CPU. And you don't really care that this changes these, that this reduces the number of loads and stores versus the naive sort of thing. What you don't want it to do is you don't want it to create a data dependent sequence of loads and stores because then you have memory side channels and likewise with the conditional select. Now, the, the other problem is, and this is zeroization, is some CPUs will detect when you're writing a line of all zeros and they will just not write the line or they'll see that the line is already zero and they'll specially optimize this case. Uh, and there's a forthcoming paper that, that Rondo and I got tipped off to that will come out sometime going into great detail about this fund. So it's not, it's not just the compilers. It's ultimately a question about the contract between the CPU and the assembly writer and the compiler and the coder and everybody has to have constant time semantics and understand what those semantics are and preserve them. So what do you feel some of those bridges need to be then between all those different parties that are kind of like in concert with this or collusion with this issue? So as far as I know, I don't, I, I, I think with the secret type thing, I, I see that we, you know, we're sort of agreement on some of the optimizations we don't want. As I, as I think we've learned from the LLVM uh, fast math debate, that's not really a productive way because compiler writers are very creative people. What you really want is you really want to have something, a submit, like the, the program has to do these things in, in the source code, it has to preserve that meaning at the assembly level. And so that sort of needs to be defined. That's, I don't really know how to define that. That's not really my area of expertise. Mm, no, I understand. Okay. Thank you very much for those points, those really great points. Um, also, I apologize again, I keep doing this. Um, this is being recorded um, as an archive, um, just to let you know that you would have heard that um, coming into the room. If there's any issue with that, please let me know. Um, but hey, Greg, great to have you as always. Uh, please share away. Hello, good, good to see you all. Uh, so I, 
I think that one thing that actually came out of both what Tony was saying, what Watson was saying, is that we really need to have two things that we need. I realize my camera's here. We have two things that we need. We've, we need to be able to annotate annotate types. This is a secret type that needs to be zeroized and we need constant time operations on it. But we also want that at the higher level of like similar to a function, because a lot of the time in both these cases, you have a function that does lots of messy things. And then, but it might output a secret that later on really matters. So you want with this, with the zeroization, you have all those ephemeral secrets, you want to get rid of them all, it's hard to track them, but you've got, but you might spit out a long-term key that needs to be zeroized too. So you need to annotate both the key and the function. And I think similarly with constant time operations, it makes sense to be able to say, here's a function, everything within this is a constant time operation. Well, but I guess with the type, because all the methods would be attached to the type and then defined that way. But we, we keep coming back to, you attach information to functions and to types, and it might, I'm not sure if this is more complexity that we need to figure out how to get rid of, or if it's simply complexity that we have to embrace, because mm. it's a pattern I'm seeing now. Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, hi, Mick, great to have you. Um, thank you, uh, and please share away. And if anyone has any follow-up points to what Greg and Watson have said, please, please do. So, Mick, thank you very much for being here. Oh, thanks for having me. Um, I'm Nick, I work on Tor. Currently, I'm working on rewriting the Tor implementation in Rust uh, for a project called Arty. So I've, I'm more of a consumer of cryptographic code and an author of cryptographic code, but I've been following efforts in this field for quite, for quite a while now to try to get constant time behavior for crypto code. And one thing I've seen kind of sync a bunch of efforts is letting the perfect be the enemy of the better, mm, yes. looking for a tool, declaring that a tool can't be deployed or can't be shipped unless it necessarily stops every side channel. I think that because of the sort of things that we've heard where um, new versions of CPU architectures can introduce new micro optimizations that change the timing of existing code, we can't, without, without support from CPU manufacturers, which may be out of scope here, we can't truly really guarantee constant time behavior from anything. Uh, but that shouldn't stop us from eliminating side channels one at a time. And I think that current best practice, or okay, I don't want to claim anything is, is necessarily best practice according to anyone, but two best practices I see that people use are um, write, write the code either in assembly or in C in a way where they can't see any branches or data dependent uh, table index indices, and then use some kind of tooling, whether it's a manually timing thing, whether it's something like Adam Langley's CT grind project to um, inspect to see what, whether what the compiler output truly is constant time or not. And I think that if we continue to suggest tooling as a way to augment possible deficiencies in constant time code generation that may suggest a, a gentler way forward for tooling that can try to provide a more and more constant time implementation of something rather than saying, well, we're going to block until LLVM makes this guarantee. We're going to block until the CPU manufacturers make this guarantee and so on. Not that anything, not that anyone was necessarily proposing that, but that's just a direction I've seen uh, thwart some projects in this field. And I hope the folks can like maybe try to think about semantics that avoid running into that problem where you can't ship until you're perfect. Thanks. Right. No, yes, thank you. Thank you. Those are some great points. Um, speaking of LLVM, uh, we, we aim on this call to have uh, just maybe someone represent LLVM in that capacity. Um, it got a bit too short notice to reach out to someone from there, but I think this is a good beginning point having, you know, Nico in the room, et cetera. And I think as this, as this discourse grows and as we continue to wrestle with this, it would be great to bring someone in from LLVM onto one of these calls so that we can all kind of really get in there and say, listen, we've got to sort this out and you're a stakeholder in this and you've got to get involved. Um, what, what, what do we 
what do we want from them, from the LLB and team in a sense? Um, and maybe that's not even the correct question, but I think as a stakeholder, what role do LLVM play through this um, in, 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 in improving this issue? Uh, and that's open to anyone. Um, so if you feel, um, f- feel free to switch on your camera and come in. Um, Tony, Nico, Rich, Bass, um, if you want to come in and chime in on that, that would be also great as well. So I did talk to you. Uh, sorry. Oh, go on, Tony. Okay. Um, I talked to Chandler Caruth on. Uh, oh, were you, you were able to? Were you able to get through to Chandler? Yeah, yeah. Um, oh. so I couldn't make the call. Uh, no, I did yeah, give a little feedback. Oh, great! And his, That's great. His, his feedback is unfortunately the thing we keep coming to. <laughs> uh, we need this sort of secret type support in LLVM, or you're not going to be able to get any guarantees out of it. Um, and I mean, the things that are really nice about it are it would. Uh, they're all, what you really want for these sort of constant time secret types is to take away any of these capabilities that you could normally do with uh, like an integer uh, that would lead to non-constant time behavior. So you wanna say you cannot index into an array, you cannot do pointer arithmetic, um, that you can't branch on it, right? Like these, these are the real kind of like verboten things. Um, there are also uh, various like uh, mathematical operations that might not be constant time, like division is uh, a notable one. Multiplication should be constant time on most uh, modern CPUs. Um, and uh, again, like Intel has guaranteed for all I think there's one it doesn't work for, but otherwise they've guaranteed for all Intel CPUs, you can uh, be assured that CMove will operate in constant time. Um, so really it's having the sort of like end-to-end support where it starts with like secret types and Rust that don't implement uh, uh, the traits that would allow you to do non-constant time things. Um, so uh, going back to what Nick said, uh, we have some crates for this. Uh, there's one called secret integers that kind of implements this concept. Um, so it gives you types that just don't implement the traits that would allow you to do bad stuff. Um, so that's cool. But to re- really get constant time guarantees, you need to start there and then all the way through, all the way through like the compiler, through the code gen, uh, these sort of invariants need to be respected. And I think otherwise it's going to be really tricky to get guarantees around this stuff. Mm. So I, I wanted see. to say, uh, you know, we're taking it as a given that Rust is based on LLVM, which is true for most people. But we have been slowly growing our alternative backend support. And for example, there's an active project integrating the Crane Lift compiler, which is much simpler in terms of the kinds of optimization it does. Uh, It is like, it is plausible that we might cut a shorter path in which we say, similar to what I was suggesting about disabling optimization, right? That we say, okay, functions that are tagged as clear the stack or whatever else, or things that interact with secret types, don't go through the standard LLVM uh, pipeline. They get generated separately. Maybe we make mirror uh, assembly directly from your, which is our inter- intermediate representation. I don't know. There are there are other routes, uh, and then when and if LLVM grows the capabilities we need, we pick them up. Um, I think that's worth thinking about. Absolutely. I guess the last uh, point is, uh, we, uh, sorry, just to finish that thought out, we are looking into doing more and more optimizations on our own internal IR, partly because we want to take advantage of Rust's type system semantics, things that LEM may not know, and uh, and partly for other reasons. But that would still that might be a way, for example, to enable us to get optimizations we want without ones we don't want relatively easily. Um. So uh, what's interesting with something like CraneLift, I dropped a link to this uh, CT WASM project. So this is the same concept as something people want in WASM as well. Um, so I think there might be an opportunity here for, uh, you know, uh, WASM and Ross to kind of come to a common shape of a solution for this problem. And then 
hopefully eventually uh you know we'll see something in lvm as well but that just it just seems like because lvm itself is so large and this touches like practically everything right it touches like every optimization pass it just needs to be implemented everywhere um it's like just a very large project to implement in the existing LLVM code base. <laughs> okay, no, that that's great. Um, Armando, great to see you again. Uh, please, please share away. Hello. Uh, yeah, my name is Armando. I I was want to point like uh, there was previous experience in a in a different language in a different context. I would say in Java at that time, uh, people was worried about synchronization and they do this uh, keyword sync that they can add- Inaudible. Oh, hello, sorry. You can hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Barely. Okay. Okay. So you can hear me now, right? Yeah, if you want to raise your volume a bit, please. Okay, well, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, at that time, Java yeah, was working with uh, uh, desynchronization and they put uh, this new uh, Disney uh, this new keyword uh, called sync. Uh, better? Okay. Yeah, so, um, sorry. <laughs> So uh, Java included this new keyword sync in order to uh, allow to do synchronization between threads more easily. I don't know. I mean, there, there was a lot of people, uh, uh, the people that just put into the, their class uh, who is not related, for example, with, with thread management, they just put sync everywhere. And then I fear that maybe this is uh, something similar here. We're just trying to put secret for all the types so maybe in the future when uh one uh developer that is not very related to crypto that say oh i want to protect all my implementation they just append secret type or i use secret uh, in my customized type and what and um, if we take the 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 way to implement secret types just by simply uh, removing the optimization so I don't think this is the, the, the good way to do it. I think uh, that what we need to do for cover the the, the constant time is uh, just to define some well-known operations and primitives that are common in several crypt implementations. Yeah, and I think that was a very good point you made there. Um, how do we avoid secrets being a blood tool that's you know just used willy nilly you know all over the place. Um, I think well, that's a that's a great question to ask. If anyone wants to come in on that, uh, Nico, it'd be great to hear from you. Well, I just want to push back a little to ask like, what's the harm we see from that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, is it uh -huh. slower? Is it mistaken misunderstandings of what you're getting from the yeah. use of secret? Yeah, basically, I mean, if if I understand correctly, so building a, a, a cryptographic uh, operation or or implementation of algorithm, it should be like a self-contained. So 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 everything that happens internally must be must the, the user of that module doesn't need to care about whether if internally it's just in secret or not. But if if we are included like a like a secret, let's say uh pragma or modifier into the way that ROS compiles so that that will apply for for all the ROS environment right and not only for for the places where it needs to be done uh great nick would you like to come in next please with your point uh yes um i think this may be similar to the point that uh rich is making on the chat that um if you define a general secret without specific neuro parameters for it, there's a risk of um, feature creep and additional requirements on the secret until 
it turns off not only the optimizations that the programmer intends to avoid, but also a wide swath of optimizations that may be irrelevant for whatever kind of secret the programmer is trying to keep right then. Having specific kinds of secrets, like, you know, there must be no timing side channels related from the contents of this variable, although it's harder to type than secret, is um, less likely to have that kind of creep and expansion until that the results in it being so slow and, and being useless. Another example of something whose semantics always get used wrong, um, a bit like the Java sync, is if you think about what what um, if you think about the history of how people have used C volatile, uh, it would be a good for secret to be. It would be a good thing for us to think about the ergonomics of secret as well, and look to see if there's other cases where people have got the ergonomics right, because the ergonomics here seem to be non-trivial, especially for programmers who haven't done like crypto in assembly. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think absolutely that's a great point. Looking at examples where people have, you know, tried to nail it or nailed it is always important. Um, so if you uh, look at the RFC I linked, um, I, I think what people generally came to is this idea of having a secret type with a uh, generic parameter to it um, and then uh, implementing like a certain set of traits for uh, like the core integer types. And that would basically be it. Um, so then you're providing these semantics only for those types. Uh, and then the idea on the LLVM side was these would map to a specific set of secret integer types uh, known to LLVM. So it wouldn't really actually be generic, but um, if you look to something like wrapping for precedent, um, you can put wrapping around a given integer and then it'll always have wrapping behavior. So it's kind of a similar idea that if you throw a secret around an integer type, it will restrict what you can do with that integer type, at least to these operations that can be performed in constant time. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Um, I kind of feel like um, it would be great to kind of maybe talk about defining the scope, maybe honing in on the scope of what, what, what this needs to be and what also it doesn't need to be as well. You know, uh, Nico, I feel, a, I feel a vision dot brewing. I feel a mini vision dot brewing in the background, maybe, you know? Um, and that could be something that we could look at as a tangible, maybe some like profiles and user stories of people who need to use secret in, you know, certain contexts and whatever else. Um, but yeah, I think that would be an interesting kind of tangible to kind of lead towards in terms of framing the scope on things. Um, Watson, I saw you switch on your camera. Um, if you do have something to share, please feel free to come in. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I've glanced at the RFC. It's, it's not just about prohibiting operations. It, it, it's about preserve, you know, part of the issue we have is it, it's about preserving semantics. If we get the, the language level semantics of, of the, what we want right, then, you know, we have an idea of what we need the compilers to do and alternate backends to do, et cetera, et cetera. If we don't have that, it will never be right. Um, and I think like that's part of what this, these various parameterizations, sure, that, that's sort of how we tell the compiler what we need, but first we need to figure out what, what it is that's supposed to happen with these types mm. in a way that we can say, yes, this optimization is safe. No, this optimization is not safe. Yeah, no, I think that great points there. Um, anybody have anything to expound on that? Um, anyone has anything to share in regards to how, you know, defining more of what it needs to be first? You know, um, I think that would be a really important point. I think, hang on, let me just scan the chat. I just want to drop in one thing. Uh, I mean, I thought Tony's example of the way it's approached in the Linux kernel was really helpful to make things concrete for me. And I do wonder if, you know, just a short document surveying different approaches, uh, maybe like two or three algorithms with, to Watson's point, what are the, what are the key 
invariants that we do want to maintain here, not so much, you know, what do we not want to do to not mess up those invariants, but what are those invariants? Um, would probably bring a lot of specificity to this discussion. Yeah, um, yeah, I agree. And um, sounds like we've got a vision doc going, right? <laughs> Maybe not quite a vision doc, no? No? Okay. Well, maybe really the seed of one, I would say. Okay. <laughs> I mean, so the the tricky thing is, it really does become what you don't want to do. <laughs> uh, um, just unfortunately, like this is the nature of things like microarchitectural side channels. Um, CPUs have been designed in sort of a dangerous way because they weren't thinking about this up front, and so. There's all sorts of things you can do that will inadvertently leak secrets and it's really enforcing that you don't do those things, uh, having like some sort of safe encapsulation for that. Yeah, yeah, no, those are great points. Uh, Nick, please come in. Uh, to expand on points from Tony just now, the one thing I think it would also be useful to include as part of any preliminary analysis is to do a search on um, software that's been written whose authors believed it to be uh, constant time but which turned out not to be constant time or and just use use that as part of our motivating examples my favorite uh examples like that are all from intel <laughs> itself um so there's like cash bleed and that kind of thing where they had a uh, certain assumptions like hey if we ensure all secrets are in the same cache line then we can kind of do like data dependent accesses within that same cache line and uh people found attacks against that um we also keep seeing them with these micro architectural side channels where intel introduces some sort of mitigation and then people find a way to kind of turn that mitigation on its head and exploit the mitigation to reveal yet another side channel um so really the safest thing you can do is just not branch on any of these secret values. Don't use them to do pointer arithmetic, don't do data dependent lookups. And if you actually do those things, in theory, you should have constant time code. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Bas, Bas shared in the chat, uh, there is also Jasmine Assembly, which has good tools for detecting side channels. Uh, would you like to expound a bit more on that, Bas? Uh, so this is a project by the, uh, the group doing uh, high assurance cryptography, mostly the group around easy Um It came out of, uh, well, one motivation was uh, Bernstein's Cosm, which also aimed to be a higher level uh, assembly. And so uh, Jasmine is, I mean, is, is used to write uh, cryptographic code directly. Um, precisely because it's hard to control side channels in, in, in any other way. Um, it has a, a compiler to a number of backends, at least x86, but also some others. Um, and it has a formalized semantics, both in COC and in EasyCrypt. It has been used for, uh, for example, uh, implementing SHA-3. So it has been used for, for some uh, real code. And it's a, it's a very active project. Tony, have you looked at it at all? I uh, use an easy crypt. It was Jasmine. I posted links in the. I, I, yeah, I, I, I've talked to like the authors of Jasmine and Hacks. Yeah. Cool. Um, but, but of course, if we lose all the information at LLVM, there's no, no point in going to Jasmine afterwards. But it, yeah. uh, since you suggested to. Um, get some consent, what is it, to sort of corner the LLVM developers by both making a sensible proposal from the risk side and the assembly side. Uh, this this could be one other point where you would uh, already have a good understanding of what constant time or site channel resistance assembly looks like. Yeah. Thank you, Bas. Um, Nick also made a point in the chat. Do we care about power consumption side channels here? Um, and that's out to everyone or EM side channels. Uh, that's its own can of worms. Uh, <laughs> like, okay. Yeah, SPA, DPA attacks. Um, really, you need algorithms that are kind of armored against them. 
And then this is where you're kind of wandering into a big patent minefield. <laughs> so uh, some of the best things you can do are these same sort of uh, constant time mitigations, right? Uh, just ensuring your code is constant time. Um, you can throw things like random blinding at it where uh, for every sort of computation you do, if you do that same computation again, there's these other like new random values mixed in there. So somebody trying to do this kind of like differential power power analysis, right? They're seeing all this like random noise kind of mixed in there. Um, and really offhand, like those are the two like simplest mitigations you can do against this. But at the same time, if you're trying to protect against this, what you're going to want to do is like scope your device and be there trying to be the attacker. You're going to want to measure and actually see that your you know proposed mitigation is actually uh, like burying that sort of like power analysis signal with this noise. Um, so it's a very tricky field. It's very kind of specialist oriented. Uh, we've put like a few things here and there in uh, some of the Rust crypto crates, uh, mostly uh, for elliptic curve cryptography. Uh, we support uh, blinding with invert or uh, blinded inversions, uh, which is important if you're trying to compute things like ECDSA signatures. Mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't guarantee that's actually working correctly because I haven't scoped it myself. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, it's its its own kind of separate thing from just trying to write uh, constant time code that you know works on like a desktop or a laptop or that kind of thing. Yeah, that's really interesting. That's really really important as well um, coming back to the points that a lot of people have been making um of perfect being the enemy of good um i just seen uh, nico make a point about that and that's been mentioned previously by others on the call let's talk about with the time that we have left um what's like the smallest simplest thing that we can do as a immediate next step i know that we have all of these things that we want to kind of open up and have done and this, the scope is so wide, you know, unwieldy, but let's pick out one step forward that we could make um, in, in, in how we want to move forward with this, um, both from like language level with Nico being here, as well as with all of us speaking about like the, 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 the this specific issue as well. Um, so, uh, Armando, be great to have you open up on that point. Mm -hmm. uh, my audio is good, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, you're, so, you sound great. Uh -huh. So uh, I think uh, easy steps could be like to find in crates, very small crates, or take particular uh, review on, on this sub subtle crate. Uh, you know, like basic operations that allows you to move some data conditionally or to to do one operation like uh, uh, selection between two sorts of data uh, uh, like uh, uh, you, you know you have two two sorts of data and then you can web bit to choose one or the other i think that are very small uh, primitives that would be that would be helpful yeah yeah, and I'm thinking even just now, even just saying that, I'm thinking now that maybe it might be worth working on having a section of the cryptography.rs page um, specifically for constant time where we've picked out some of the low hanging fruit that already exists to allow for some of the things that we want done to happen. It won't be the comprehensive, all encompassing, all singing, all dancing stuff that we want, but there are things there already. There's things that Nico has already mentioned. There are things that Tony and Bass and all of the tooling that already exists that may allow people to get something done and something out of it initially before we start moving on to like, you know, fully featuring and fully, you know, fleshing out everything that we would want from this. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense, but not. I mean, not only less than. So, what we want from the from the from the people uh, is that try to take special attention in this in these primitives because mm. if if they're gonna be used everywhere, or if we are aiming to that special primitives will be used everywhere, then uh, 
uh, more, uh, yeah, we need to, to know them, but we also need to know the internals. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, two points here. Uh, first point for Nicola is, is there something that we can do to revive the secret RFC if it's, if, if it's postponed, right? Or to propose an alternative? And I'll pose that to Nico, um, and then anyone else can come in after that. Well, yes, <laughs> you could write a laying team proposal. Um, that's the new process. Let me just uh, just drop a link in here. Um, I don't know. You know that would prompt some discussion about whether this is a direction we want to go and so forth. But I think for me. I would have nothing against a proposal, but it seems a bit premature. I still think the right first step is probably like this idea of collecting a few examples of uh, code, you know, might it be C code or Rust code or whatever that achieves the properties or ways that people have tried to achieve and looking at them and thinking like, what are they trying to say here? And can we, that's the most direct way to say it. Um, Anyway, that, that, and that but would, I, I think we're not far from like where a proposal would make sense, but there's probably okay. a little more background to help people realize, help people uh, envision what it really is <laughs> that we're trying to yeah. do. And I think that's very much in line with what Nick has suggested as well. So that's kind of like us coming to a consensus about that. That might be the first, first initial step is, you know, compiling some, uh, uh, Rich has just suggested a survey doc, uh, which he would like to help on as well. Uh, that's great, Rich. Would you like to expound a bit more on that? Uh, I think no, I, that could... I, that, it was just uh, saying what I think Nico said, which is let, let's yeah. look at, you know, what is the, I forget, SOC, stated in SOK, state of knowledge. Mm. But yeah. Okay. I think we all have experience on how we've been burned in the past, and writing that <laughs> down would be helpful. <laughs> Or many of them. Yeah. And I think that can work in concert with some of the, the suggestions Nick and Nico have both made around um, compiling um, uh, fragments yeah. of code that achieve what you're looking for as well. Um, I think just another... getting two or three people on a call <laughs> for an yeah. hour would probably lead to a lot of progress. Yes. Um, so that could be a follow up actionable that we could get from this call as well. I just wanted to pick out a point that um, Giles made. Uh, would focusing on WASM make the problem harder or easier? Uh, what are our thoughts on that? I hey, think, what's um, your... Yeah, you want to say something? Oh, else? no, no, sorry. You go ahead, Tony, <laughs> okay. and then what's going to come in after. Yeah. So you, you go, you, uh, you're the race started, Tony. No worries. I, I think we can uh, look to WASM as like trying to solve a, a similarly shaped problem. Um, and yeah, I linked to some efforts there. Um, and hopefully maybe there's some collaboration with backends like Cranelift, uh, trying to implement these same features in WASM. Mm, yeah, absolutely. Uh, what's coming next? I mean, if, if the was if WASM has a semantics that's detailed enough to let us transform into it. And that solves half the problem. We still need the problem of defining the semantics of what of what the of the program, and including the operation, the the, the property, the side channel properties we care about, and and that I think is going to be a lot of work. And it's going to require looking at whatever we have in terms of Rust semantics now. Um, Amando, please. Uh, the difference with Wasm is that uh, Wasm runs in software, right? Uh, and if, if, if so, the thing, yeah, uh, as, as Watson mentioned, so maybe is Watson the one that must provide certain primitives or certain uh, help on that, and then other languages plug into into that. So I think, uh, which is different, that modifying, let's say. Uh, an Intel architecture or uh, an ARM architecture, right? Yes. Because it's hard work. Okay. So just before, because I think we're going to finish up now. Um, Nico has to drop off as well. I think we've gotten three kind of like next steps from this. 
um, or two, definitely two, a survey, um, a call with two or three individuals just to really hone in on some of the pain points and um, looking for fragments of code that, or that, that have already done or already do what we're looking for to be done here. Um, does that make sense? Are those three things the things that make sense that we've just picked out? As like actionable next steps, uh, please feel free to come in and say yes or no um, to take a general kind of survey now. Um, Nico, uh, just before you have to drop off because I know you have a busy schedule, do, do those three things make sense as like next things to do? We arrange a call, we get a survey going, and we also look for like fragments of code. I think that makes sense. Yeah, great. Um, I will then, I just want to say a big thank you for being here. Big thank you for listening to us and taking our um, uh, community feedback on board with you back to the language team and the compiler team. And we're looking forward to working together to making you know, things better and some forward next steps. So you're always welcome here. It's always great to have you. And um, yeah, let's, let's, let's carry on this positive, positive momentum. Um, Tony, uh, how does that sound? It's positive, positive next steps. Those three things. Okay, Armando, Watson, Nick, how do those next steps sound? Sounds good. Great, great, great. Oh, I think Watson, you're still on mute. Sounds good. I'm happy to be roped in to whatever needs help. Amazing. Works for me. Um, CC me and I'll help if I can, uh, if it's in what I know. Amazing. Amazing, great. And of course, all of you on the call as well, um, your feedback is very much appreciated. Um, if you don't want to say anything now, please feel free to um, open an issue on the coordination repo. There's a link to it somewhere in the chat. Um, also, you can DM at DevX Initiative on Twitter. Um, and also, we'll share the email address and um, other ways to get in contact for your feedback as well thank you all very much for being here um this was really good really positive lots of really um, um uh, things that have been discussed and we're looking forward to the next one and actually getting some things done and getting into the in, into the guts of this so um the next call will be next month um we're going to continue working with this um oh yes there's also a zulip as well we have a zulip so if you want to make any points in the Zulip, please do. Um, I think uh, Tony has got the link for that. Um, you can share that at some point. We'll also tweet that out as well. This recording will come out as an archive um, on the YouTube channel for DevX Initiative. So please look out for that on Twitter. And we'll see you all at the next one, hopefully. Um, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you all very much for being here. And we'll, just, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see you all soon. Take care.